This is Raw, a podcast by Greta Pools. Series two is The Nature Cure. Sheila Wilson was 85 when I interviewed her in September of 2019. She lives in the UK. We connected through the book I published in 2017 on Perth naturopath Dorothea Snook. In one of Mrs. Snook's books, there was a reference to 19th century French tightrope walker Charles Blondin. It was a reference in terms of mind over matter. In 1859, Blondin was the first person to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He was a superstar of his day. I mentioned Blondin's name to a colleague who said her mother-in-law, Sheila, and Sheila's now deceased husband, Ken, had written Blondin's biography. So I got in contact with Sheila, who it turned out was also a nature cure healer and had recently retired from work as a reflexologist. Reflexology is based on the ancient belief that certain zones in the feet relate to specific organs and parts of the body. By systematically massaging the feet, you can detect blockages in particular areas and improve energy flow. Sheila is also trained in the laying of hands, a form of spiritual or energy healing. She actually worked as an energy healer in a GP surgery in the UK back in the 1980s. When Sheila visited Australia, I sat down to talk to her about healing, her life and loves, and if babies might be seeing auras when they stare so intently up at you. I really enjoyed my conversation with Sheila. I was born in London, Camberwell in 1935 and at a year old uh, of course it was the most incredible time in history because it was the year of three kings in the UK so yeah 1935 I'm 85 next April and had an incredible life nearly died at the age of six weeks old and I had what was known as pyloric stenosis, and it's quite unusual for baby girls. They didn't want to operate, but my father insisted they should operate. Surgeons said it was a 75% chance of losing me while I'm still here. My mother, tremendously strong woman, but very loving. Both parents were very loving parents, and so... I was very fortunate. Of course, my father went into the Navy when I was just five years old, so I regretfully didn't have him for six years of the war. Do you um, remember the war years at all? Or is it... Yes, I remember them quite well, really. What do you remember? Yes, I remember a Messerschmitt flying down our road quite low. That was a German aircraft fighter, a Messerschmitt, flying down quite low, and shooting. And the only thing I believe he shot was a rabbit hutch at the end of the road. It got that. I don't know if it got the rabbit, but it certainly hit the rabbit hutch. Yes, they did that. They thought that was fun. But nobody was killed on that occasion, but they often did play those games. Low flying air fighters, planes, Bombs dropped quite nearby because we were very close to Woolwich, which was often hit by German bombers. And I would wake up at night and hear the guns firing. I was evacuated to Leicestershire in the Midlands for about six months with my sister. That was a sad time leaving my mother, but we were in safe. It was safe. My memory of being evacuated was going to a new school, which I didn't like, but also wandering around at a very young age with my young sister, just having, being able to wander around places like rivers, alongside rivers. I was with my cousin and she fell into a canal and couldn't swim and I got her out and saved her, really. How old Um, were you then? Yes, six years old. Mm. Incredibly young. Yes, it showed a bit of, uh, well, 
initiative because <laughs> mm. I didn't swim well myself because during the war, the swimming pools were closed, so we didn't get a, an opportunity to practice swimming. So I don't know why I thought I could go into the canal and fish her out when I couldn't swim well myself. Didn't think. Were you brought up with a religious faith? Did you feel that there was yes. someone yes. watching you over you? I did, actually. My mother liked us to go to what was called a medical mission, a building quite close to where we lived. It wasn't a church, but it was more Methodist, I believe. I did have a strong faith. I haven't got a strong faith now, but because doubts creep in as you get older and logic creeps in, and you can't have logic if you're religious. You can't have logic. You just accept and keep your faith, which I did for many, many years. There are times when I doubt, and that's hard. I believe there is a divine force, and that is probably my faith. That's how I consider there is a divine force. I don't go along with afterlife. I don't know how I feel about that, really. But yes, I think we're spiritual beings. At a time when I was interested in reflexology, for instance, I was also interested in healing. And that came about simply because I had extremely hot hands and I spoke to a friend and she said, well, you're probably a healer. And I wondered about that, but I thought I'll look into that more, find out about what that is all about. So I went to my church to speak to the vicar and the vicar quickly moved me on considering Jesus Christ taught or was a healer. He didn't want to know about that. So I got in touch with the Spiritual Healers, a big association in the UK, and they said, come along and have a chat, which I did. I could be a healer at a session in Bromley, in Kent, in Bromley. They had monthly meetings and I could practice healing there. They were the association, and I don't know the, I should tell you the proper name and I can't think of it, the Association of Spiritual Healers, I don't know. They have a set course for you to study because they like to be professional about it. Like to make a science of it all. Probably. So I thought, well, I'll go on the course. So I did. I went and did this course of instruction, and which was very helpful because it showed me how to relax perfectly, purposefully relax, and then use the healing that they felt. They didn't believe in any creed. It was a universal energy. They considered it to be a universal energy, which you could bring down into your hands and do the laying on of hands. They also advocated just moving your hands around the outside of the body. I would have been 46, something like 46 years old, yes, um, when I started to do did that. Did you still have children at home? Yeah, they were still Simon and yeah. Matthew were still at home. Yep. And I would attend this every week, this session. People would come and sit down and you could hear if they wanted to talk, you could listen. If not, you could just do the healing, which was the aura around the body, which you came in touch with. And it was quite strong. And a lot of people got a lot from it. Did you see auras or did it sort of spark in you this feeling, ah, these are experiences I've had before when I was younger and I have felt that I've either seen an aura or I've known something was going to happen, a sort of a psychic experience? Did No, you I've never had a psychic experience. But one of the things that did happen, and I'm jumping to reflexology, right. yeah. when I am working on the feet, I find uh, things do drop into my mind 
about the person's body. I always do, as is recommended by the Association of Reflexologists, I always say if I find anything in a person's foot, I would always say, see your general practitioner about this. I would never say that I could heal a person's complaint, but it often went into my mind what that complaint was. If there was a lung problem or possibly, I don't know about cancer, but a very difficult part of the body was showing itself to be unwell then I would suggest that they did see their practitioner. That's sort of an intuition you got through knowledge and experience. Yes, yes. But it was uh, odd that I didn't think it through. It would just drop into my mind to, to do that. Whether that's psychic or not, I don't know. It reminds me a little bit of what one of Mrs Snook's daughters said about her. And she, well, they believe she was psychic and that her mother was and that she would have dreams and say that person's going to die and the next day mm. I'd hear that person had died or something like that. And one of her clients who was a policeman but was quite interested in mysticism, Indian mysticism, he said that he could see the aura around Mrs. Snook. Now, I've never seen an aura, but I do. you do get that sense of energy from people. I remember seeing some photography of someone took uh, photographs of the aura around people, wow. and it was quite strong. The okay. colours were strong. And I've often wondered, I've uh, seen young children, babies, staring at me mm. and I wondered whether they see more than, and they lose it as they mm. get bigger but babies you think what, Why what is a that? great idea because they always stare and I think they see more of mm. what's going on around us than we do do you believe in a soul in the soul yes I do I had a friend who was a midwife and sister in a hospital and she said she was often at people's death and she would see a silver line leave their bodies and she was so convinced that was the spirit leaving the body. I believe that there is another dimension, but it's not as is, it's not like heaven is described it's just another dimension. I'm not certain I would ever see anyone that I loved, but I think that love that you have is so strong that it, it has to go somewhere. I went to Pittman's College to learn shorthand typing. I wanted to be a model. I had that as a hobby for a long time, fashion, and I wanted to be a model. So my mother said, OK, we'll go to the Lucy Clayton Fashion a model agency and see what they think. They said that I walked well, I looked well, but I was not photogenic. Oh, well, if I can't be in the glosses, I wouldn't bother with that then. So my mother said, let's, let's look at Pittman's College, learn shorthand typing, then you can go and work in the fashion industry. How about that? So I did that. And it was a very good way of getting into wherever you wanted to be. If you wanted to travel, join an airline as a secretary or shorthand typist, the fashion industry or whatever you wanted to be. So Sheila, if you want to describe to me the day that you saw the Beatles perform, so what was the newspaper that you were working at then? I was working for the Southern News Services of Canada and they sent out stories to syndicated throughout Canada, so Calgary, Vancouver, Ottawa, Winnipeg, all through Canada. So I started to work there as a girl Friday, and I was asked by the editor to... Uh, I saw an invitation come through the post for an evening with Princess Margaret, this is a long time ago. And she was attending an evening for Christian Dior. And it was at a London venue, which was 
very exciting to go to. And I took my sister. I was able to take another person. So we went along to the Yves Saint Laurent, not Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent evening of fashion attended by Princess Margaret. And the next morning when I went into the office, my editor said, did you enjoy last night? And I said, yes, it was. He said, don't tell me about it, write about it. And I was astonished, but he wanted me to write about this. And so I sat down at the typewriter and didn't know where to start. So he came into my office and said, you must always think of the five who, what, why, when, where. Who, what, why, when, where. So you cover those five things in your first paragraph. So get started. So I got started. So having written one piece and then seeing it with my byline, Sheila Dunn, throughout the syndicate, we got newspaper clippings sent back to us. It was so exciting, my byline. I was so fortunate to be able to do this. So I went on several excursions, assignments, one to a white witch in the south of England, Hampshire, and interviewed her. That was she, in the 1960s, was it? It was actually 1964. This year was particular. I was pregnant with my first child. I was pregnant. So when I went to visit the white witch, she emphasised to me, do not lie on your back to give birth. It's against all gravitational forces. You must squat like gypsies do, and you'll find it much easier. Of course, it's impossible. You get taken to the delivery room. You can't just say, I'm going to squat. So, no. However, that was a good interview. And there were lots of things that Charles King, who was the editor, assigned me to, peculiar to Britain, to interview someone who was selling snuff still in the West End. So I went to his little shop and interviewed him. So there were lots of things which were peculiarly English. Did you try snuff? English. Did you try the No, snuff? I didn't try snuff. <laughs> <laughs> but he showed me how to use it. And then it was Princess Alexandra's wedding. So I went to that and covered that for the Southern News Services of Canada. And here again, I got stuck. You know, I come and sit at the typewriter and nothing would happen. And Charles would just come in and say, well, what appealed to you most about that occasion? What was it? And I, well, all the beautiful hats, all the colours. So then he got me started with those who, what, why, when, where, those five important Ws. Then the Beatles were becoming very, very popular. Well, they were already popular in the 1960s, early 1960s. But so were a lot of groups. A lot of young boys had bands and groups and they were getting a lot of coverage. It was a wonderful time for young men who wanted to work in the industry, music industry, not so much girls. So that's why the Spice Girls later on was such a phenomenon because there weren't so many girls, but plenty of boy bands and boy groups. And they'd been invited to appear at the Royal Command performance. I think it was the Prince of Wales Theatre. And I received a ticket, or Charles did receive a ticket, to go along and watch rehearsal and interview the Beatles. And uh, he said, you go. So, okay, I'll go. So as I walked in the front door, they just arrived. So later on in the day, there was a picture of me with the Beatles in the evening news, which was quite lovely, <laughs> cut out for posterity. Um, Do you and still then, have that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I, um, I went to sit in the stalls and there were only one or two people there, the producer of the show and the sound man, people like that, because it was the rehearsal. And that. So I sat in there and uh, I watched uh, one of the, I arrived in time to see a puppet show. What are they called? Puppets. A puppet show. And then um, on came the Beatles. And at that time, of course, they were popular because of songs like She Loves Me, Yeah, 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 those sort of numbers. And they were appearing where they couldn't be heard because of the screaming teenagers. So 
After they'd finished singing, I went backstage. Did you enjoy their music? Not particularly. I went backstage. <laughs> I like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> to compare that with the Beatles and you've got a genre that's miles apart. So I went backstage with the intention of arranging an interview with them, which had already been arranged in advance. But I just met Ringo Starr coming out of their dressing room to go to the men's room. And he said, oh, we're going to be held up. Our manager, Brian Epstein, is talking to us. So can you wait on and see us afterwards? So I said, OK. And I looked at my watch and I thought, oh, I'm going to miss that five o'clock train. And then it'll be standing all the way home. And by the time I get home, uh, I think I'm going to give it a miss. And so I didn't go in to interview the Beatles when they were ready. That was fine. They didn't mind. It didn't matter to them. And the next morning when I went into the office, Charles said, how did you get on? I said, well, I didn't get in to see them. Things were held up. I didn't know how long they'd be. I got the train to catch. He was fine about it. He said, oh, well, well can, if you just put something together. So I did their background piece uh, a piece on their background and as I got to the end of it I, I just ended it by saying I think my exact words were here today and gone tomorrow like any other group or like many groups today here today and gone tomorrow and uh, that's been my legacy really because they're geniuses <laughs> they were geniuses and they've written so many wonderful songs that are still being sung today Sheila married her first husband when she was 23. They met on the commuter train to London. Their marriage didn't last, something which Sheila regrets. Following her divorce, she met Ken Wilson, her second husband, who she calls the great love of her life. I went to work at the theatre and he was the architect of the theatre and it was the opening night and he came to talk to the public relations officer and I was the assistant public relations officer, so I met Ken. Um, Prince Charles was opening the theatre, and so that was a great occasion for Bromley, and so I was involved very much in organising things for that. He was just such a wonderful person, and I loved him very much, and we had a, a wonderful 30-year marriage. So I was very fortunate to have that with him. Sheila was eventually forced to leave her job at the theatre and return to her writing career. So I applied for a job with Seven Oaks Chronicle and it was not writing news reports, it was writing advertising reports. I think they call it the hacks job. So you write a whole article about a product or a business. And so I started to do that. And trying to connect. And at that time, I think it was the hands were burning. I asked Sheila how the laying of hands works. You could put your hands on somebody's head, mm. but the rest of the body, you would go to the aura around the body. So you actually wasn't touching, but the heat of your hands or the energy in your hands, mm. which you were transmuting from the universe mm. because they didn't believe in. But I always said the Lord's Prayer. Whether that was right or not, I don't know. But that's what I did. Before I did my healing, I said the Lord's Prayer. And I felt it was stronger my healing was stronger by using that force, but other people didn't. They connected in a different way. The universal energy, I think, they connected to. But Do you I still can't. believe in that, the universal energy? I believe there is a universal energy, yeah. and I believe with practice, everyone can do it. It's a bit like dousing. You know, with practice, everybody can use the pendulum or the whatever. The, um, yeah, oh my goodness, Mom, my, my father used to do that, the water divine. Yes, yes, yeah. I believe that is within everyone. It's covered up with our evolution, but it was a primitive thing that we used for survival and it was something more than intuition. It came through us and we used divining rods 
or the pendulum as an aid to get to what information you want. Mm. So I was into that too. But the healing, um, yes, uh, I got a phone call from a local doctor who said, I understand you're a healer. The Association of Healers, Spiritual Healers, has put, given me your name. Would you be prepared to come to the local surgery? Because my healer has broken her arm and she suggested you might like to take her place. And it was a local GP and he was, uh, he had lived in Africa. And so he was all into witch doctors and all the things they could do. So it was of no big deal to have his own healer. So he had his own healer in the surgery. Who in was Kent? Was in Kent, who was paid for by the National Health. So he applied to the National Health for funds to fund his healer. So Hillary was his in-house healer. I'm not sure if it would happen today. Yeah. I've never really, I've not really looked into it, whether they carried on. But Hillary came back and she was with Dr. Backer and I was with Dr. Hillary. His name's gone. Benson. Anyhow, I was with him for, and what I would do, I would go into the surgery half an hour before his surgery started and take his, because it wasn't on computer, take his pile of client's folders in my hands and send my healing through their folders in my hands. So there were all their files in my hands and then I would heal them. I would ask that they be open to healing this afternoon. Simple. I make it a very simple message and put my hands between the two. So there might have been, say, half a dozen people he was going to see. And so I would be holding on to them. And then when he came in, I would give them to him. And the first person that would come in would come in smiling. And he'd say, how are you today? And they'd say, oh, feeling very good. <laughs> and you'd think, why have they come? <laughs> why have they come? They're feeling very good. But there was, um, there was a whole feeling that went into that. And... He was, the doctor was very pleased with the way it was he happening. He noticed a difference. And there was a difference. There was definitely a difference. So after the first two s surgeries, he asked me to stay on. And, mm. you know, that was, I did that. For, how long did I do that? I must have done that for about three years, working for the NHS as a healer. Were there any clients that you remember, that kind of any profound stories that sort of, um, that you feel like you made a difference? A couple, the doctor asked me to visit them at home and there was one who had got cancer of the esophagus and had tried everything, had orthodox medicine that is, and so I would go and give him sessions of healing. I would be with him. He survived for another couple of years, but then he died. But it was explained to me at one time that, you know, you can do healing unto death. You can make the death of someone different by giving them healing. And I believe that. I believe that there was a different feeling about that man for him. It was easier to die with healing. And so I carried that through, actually. After I left the surgery, for I can't remember why. Oh, the doctor left. And the third doctor in the practice wasn't interested in having a healer. That was it. He left to, to go into research. And so I left then. But I thought I will carry on healing and I will not advertise myself. But if somebody calls me, I will go to their home. And I did do this on several occasions to people who were terminally ill. And I believe that the healing brought great comfort to them. In what way? I, they didn't believe that I was curing them. I don't think that was ever there. It wasn't a case of curing, but it was a case of being with them totally, wholly. So I think that meant a lot that I was with them wholly. And also, was there something to do with an energy connection? 
they didn't necessarily have to believe. Mm. Some did, others didn't. What did you think? But I believe that there was a connection because I never got to the stage when I put my hands close to someone where my hands felt cold. I never got that turn off. It was always turned on. If I chose to give healing to someone, then my hands would answer that. And I never got turned off from that. And so if it brought comfort, then that was all I was interested in, knowing that uh, that comfort was there. But there wasn't any miraculous cures, to my knowledge. And I think with practice, and the practice I'm talking about is the person who's giving the healing has to totally relax and not put any assumption that something's going to happen. It's very easy to see someone who's very sick and wish them well. I, even now, when we are asked to think of people in church who are unwell, I never think of them as being unwell. I always think of that person as smiling. So I don't put that curing energy onto someone. It's not my place to cure or even wish for a cure. We don't know what's happening to that person and why they're going to die. And if they are ready for death, then it's not for us to change that. But to help them through that period, is uh, that's the miracle of it, I believe, to be able to bring that about. And with my own relatives and family, if I start getting desperate about healing them, you may as well not bother because you're putting all that negative energy into. From childhood, Sheila had always been interested in reflexology. Well, I think my dad was very interested in feet mm. and he couldn't follow that through when he left the forces. But I think someone must have talked to him about reflexology while he was in the Navy because I remember him mentioning it to me as a young girl. So that was in my mind about feet and way back. I was doing the healing first with the doctor. And then, did I go and have my feet done? Somebody may have done my feet. And then, yes, that was it. I went to have a trial session with someone and thought how wonderful that was, how relaxing it was. And then I thought, well, I can do this. Anatomy and physiology Yes, I can do this. I'd stop writing for the local paper. I was on to what am I going to do next? I'll do anatomy and physiology and learn about reflexology. You had to do a two-year course with the Association of Reflexologists. And the two-year course included 100 hours of actually doing feet, practical. But the rest of the time you were doing what nurses have to do, and that is the anatomy and physiology and pass that exam. So that was quite full on with lots of uh, essays to write and doing a a proper course of study. So you described to me a session, how it would work. Was it an hour session? It was an hour because you have to take full notes of their background, their medical if they're on any prescriptions, anything about their medical life. So you needed to have that in writing. And you would also write down what you found at the end of the session so that the next time they came, you would see what you had found, if you had found anything during the session. And it's an interesting thing that when you take a foot in your hands and you start the process At first, you don't pick up anything at all. What I'm saying is that it's easy to pass over. What you're looking for is any kind of feeling like grit under the skin. Of course, it's not there. But you're feeling for any change in the physiology of the foot. So I could do your hand, for instance. This is how it started. Eunice Ingham in the United States was working for a doctor. And he used his hands to use the hand. So you can map out on the hand the whole body. She thought if you can do it on the hand, you could do it on the foot, which is a much more tender area to work on. 
than the hand. So she decided that that's what she would do, Unisingham. So she was the first to do that. And there are lots of pictures of the hand and the foot pointing out various parts of the body. So, for instance, your thumb is your head and your spine. So if I got backache, I work down my thumb to my wrist from the outside edge. I work all the way down. And what you're doing is little caterpillar movements, tiny little caterpillar movements. So it's easy to gloss over and do it quickly and miss. So you must do it very carefully, little caterpillar movements, and work all the way through the whole body. You're in touch with the whole body on the foot or on the hand. If there's an injury to the foot, go to the hand and work the hand. And it's just as good, I think, to work the hand as it is the foot. But most people prefer the foot. They can relax more. The whole essence of it is that you're bringing about homeostasis. You're bringing about a deep relaxation so that the body can get on with the job of healing itself. You are not healing anyone. You are bringing about the homeostasis for the body to do its job of healing. So when your patient, client, person in front of you is totally relaxed, which you, as a good reflexologist, should bring about very quickly, then in that total relaxation, that deep relaxation, then conflicts in the body can be healed. The body is going to do the job of healing, not you. The body will get on with the job of healing. And, of course, there are so many factors. If they're on medication, that can work against you because things are masked by Mm. painkillers and so forth. I had the impression that if I needed the big guns, please give me the big guns. I've had a, a really bad fall and broken my hip. Or I didn't want anybody to come do reflexology on my foot. No, give me drugs, give me everything to take the pain away and give me my new hip. So I'm very much of the opinion, and so many people are, that you need complementary therapies as well as orthodox medicine. Sheila is active in the University of the Third Age. She likes going to theatre and concerts. She started online dating at age 81, around four years after Ken's death. And then came her star turn back in 2017 on a television dating show. On a whim, she applied to be a contestant on First Dates Hotel, a British reality TV show filmed at a luxury hotel in the south of France. Sheila would go on a dinner date with a contestant, all filmed for the cameras. I was watching television programme first dates it was called first dates and they were celebrities and they were meeting blind dates really and I thought what fun and at the end of the uh, and I'd met a lot of celebrities in theatre so it was common for me to meet celebrities it wasn't a big deal because when I worked at the theatre I met plenty however at the end of the program they invited people to write in to be on the show So I thought, "Mm, I'll do that. So I emailed. um, I said I played the ukulele, told them how old I was and so forth. And the next morning, I got a reply. And they said, don't expect a reply. Hundreds of people write in. So I thought it must have been the ukulele that did it. And so would you come up, be interviewed? Yeah, I'll do that. And it was Channel 4, Channel 4 and BBC Channel 4. And they... They were so kind and so nice. Sheila was flown to the south of France where she had dinner with her blind date, a 79-year-old balding and bearded widower named Bev. When I later searched for the show in around 2019-2020, I came across a short clip from Sheila and Bev's date that had gone viral in the British press. Sheila says she's a bit embarrassed about it all now, but I'm not letting her off the hook that easily. This is a clip from the show. One of the things I put on my list of requirements in a man 
was fingernails and yours are very good so I'm yeah. going to tick that box and I don't mind bald but I don't want hair that is pulled over the top. I could grow my hair and come bald like this. <laughs> that would be terrible. Wouldn't it just? But the other box that I put, clean shaven. And they've said the <laughs> idea. <laughs> you can't tick that box. You wouldn't like to see me clean shaven. Why is that? Different person entirely. People are. Maybe you can tick all the other boxes. Okay, let's have a look. Somebody interested in theatre? Yes. Been to see Pavarotti? Oh, wonderful Pavarotti. Music can move you when nothing else can. Yes, this is true. Because I, I'm harping back, but for my wife's uh, celebration of her life, we had Pavarotti time to say goodbye, and I sat there and bored. Of course she would. After their dinner, the pair moved outside into a pretty garden area to recline on chairs by the pool, looking up at the evening sky. Sheila told me about the allure of a free trip to France to stay at a nice hotel was partly the incentive for applying for the show. She likes to have adventures. We then see Sheila and Bev together in the confession room, fronting the television cameras to report on their date. A large red heart features on the backdrop behind them. The producer asks if they would like to see each other again. So... Would you like to see each other again? Oh, and I said to you, you've got to answer first. All uh, right, yes, 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 yes. I'd like to see Bev again. Yes. Beard or not. Beard or not. <laughs> the clip ends with a swelling music and a brief kiss. Is it as bad as it seemed? Yep. <laughs> see. Now, you're the first woman I've kissed since my wife died. Oh, and how was it for you? It was nice. Sheila has moved on since the first date show. She has a companion in her life, but her love for Ken will always still be there. Tell me about love because I noticed that you mentioned that wonderful love experience of love that you felt romantic love with your second husband I don't think it ever dies I mean when you have that feeling of love for someone and it is encompassing all-encompassing love unconditional you're not trying to change someone that's inappropriate so it's an all-encompassing love and it is so big that it can't just die it has to be in the atmosphere it has to stay and I think that's the spirit of love. And that if that person dies, then while I'm still alive, or the person who's loving is still alive, then that is very real. When they go, it's still there. That love is still there because we are now picking up energy with our telephones and that we never could have imagined with the aid of a telephone, a mobile phone, you are picking up. You can telephone people oh, thousands and thousands of miles away and it's not a connecting wire. There isn't anything to be seen. So the fact that you can't see that love, it doesn't mean to say it's not there. And two people can pick it up, but if those two people aren't there, it's still there. I believe it's still there. And it will always be there. That love is still there. So do you think it seems like that's what you think is sort of a, a very powerful force in life? Do you think that the point of life of living is to to give and receive love? Is that a comment that you would care to reflect on? If it was possible for that to happen universally, there wouldn't be wars, there wouldn't be jealousy and power and all the struggles that go on in the war if that love was so powerful but somebody once said to me well only 0.000 percent of the world is evil but that tiny percent is uh, overpowering well if love was like that and that love could encompass love it's not going to happen is it human beings are what human beings are and but you can only transmute, presumably, what you know yourself. And so do you think it's sort of a worthwhile thing 
in your life has love been sort of something that's made life worth living? I mean, my second marriage was a wonderful marriage and happy and loving and desperate when he went. And But knowing that love, I've been able to keep myself open to receiving affection from somebody else. I mean, it's it, nothing would ever change my second marriage, the love in my second marriage. Nothing would ever remotely compare but it does keep you open to uh, that, that loving to another person the person that I'm with now is a friend but he lost his wife and so he was desperate for a while and we come together and we enjoy life together well I think it was quite a long time before my current boyfriend <laughs> Um, and it was quite a long time before we went to bed together and it was wonderful because it had been some years not sharing that and I was just amazed that I could have orgasm at, at, in my 80s it doesn't go away it really doesn't go away so I was still enjoying sex with him we don't do it very often but when we do it's wonderful Raw is a podcast by Greta Pools. Subscribe to Raw The Nature Cure where you get your podcasts or visit the website, all one word, rawthepodcast.com.